Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Johnson and I am a community coach with the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program. I'm joined by my colleague Mary Bennett. Hello everyone, wonderful to talk with you today and uh, I hope everyone is benefits from this uh, wonderful webinar. I'll be chatting out information to you throughout the webinar. Thanks, Mary. We are so excited that you all have joined us today um, on this Rankings in Action Opioid Overdose and Naloxone Access webinar. We are thrilled to have two wonderful guests with us, Corey Davis from the Network for Public Health Law and Robert Childs with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, they're going to be talking with us about opioid overdose and the harm reduction strategy of naloxone access. So it's great to have you, Corey and Robert. I want to say hello to the to our participants. Hello, thank you for having me here today. Yes, hello, same. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So um, first, we'd like to acknowledge the important relationship that we have with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. As many of you know, the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program is a collaboration between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. And for those of you who may be new to our webinars, we want to take a moment to get you oriented to the technology we're using today. The GoToWebinar attendee interface is made up of two parts. On the left, you can see the control panel. Um, that's the viewer window. Excuse me. On the left is the viewer window where you see um, our screen throughout the presentation. And on the right, you can see the control panel. You can also interact with us by um, using the control panel and submitting your questions today. Uh, feel free to ask questions or share your thoughts um, and experiences with us via this control panel and we'll make sure to leave time for your questions. And this is a question that will guide our webinar today. How can communities implement the harm reduction strategy of naloxone access to address opioid overdoses? Um, we know there's uh, work happening in this area across the country. If there's examples that you'd like to share about what's worked in your community, feel free um, to use that uh, question box and share what's worked well. And be sure to include your community so that we can share with others on the webinar today. As we move into the real content of the webinar, we'd like you to consider these questions as you listen. Who else do you need to share this information with? Um, what's an idea for action that you're taking from this webinar? And what else do you need to know to take action or to use this information in your local community? So we're going to start with a brief program overview to ground our discussion in the county health rankings and roadmaps. And this will take just a few minutes. If you're newer to us, this will give you a high-level overview of the county health rankings and roadmaps. And for those of you who have been with us before, this will be a little bit of a review. Um, so bear with us. To learn more, you um, can check out one of our rankings and roadmaps 101 webinars. And Mary will be chatting out a link, if she hasn't already, to our most recent recent recording. So as many of you know, the county health rankings ranks the health of nearly every county in every state. And for each county, you'll find two rankings, one for health outcomes and one for health factors. The image that you see on your screen here shows the relationship between um, policy, health factors, and health outcomes. Um, it illustrates why it's important for communities to think of health broadly, to take a broad definition of health, and that many factors impact how long and how well we live. So things like how we commute to work and housing conditions and quality of our schools, even things like our social connectedness, all impact our health outcomes. So what does this image tell us? Well, starting from the bottom, we know that effective local, state, and federal policies and programs can improve a variety of factors that in turn shape the health of communities. And we also know that there are many factors that shape our community's health outcomes. We specifically look at health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. And we also measure two types of health outcomes to show how healthy each county is, the length of life and the quality of life. 
So today's webinar focuses on alcohol and drug use, and we'll hear from Corey Davis and Robert Childs about their work in advocating for and implementing naloxone access programs. Um, but I'd like to just check in with Corey um, for a moment. Corey, when you take a look at our model, where do you see your work um, through the Network for Public Health law in our model? <laughs> You know, great question. I mean, I would say that the work of the Network for Public Health Law really encompasses nearly all of this. I mean, we are available to help people working in public health writ large who are dealing with really any of these issues. I mean, maybe a little bit less on clinical care, but certainly the, the policy and legal aspects related to, to clinical care. Yeah, thanks so much. You're really grounded in in the work that we're doing, but more at a kind of the, the broader sort of health policy level. So I appreciate you being here today. Um, so why is this work important? Well, we are learning that intention, unintentional drug overdoses are at an epidemic in our country and that many communities are really struggling to find solutions and more and more communities um, are starting to identify naloxone access as an opportunity to help save lives in their community. Um, if we take a closer look at what we measure for drug poisoning in the county health rankings, I just would like to show you a snapshot from um, Dane County, Wisconsin. That's where we're based. And we're going to take a quick look at additional measures. This is the snapshot of, of additional measures here, and more specifically at drug poisonings. So we measure drug poisoning deaths as an additional measure. And what you're seeing on this slide is that between the years of, 20, of 2006 and 2012, Dane County had a drug poisoning mortality rate of 12. Um, so that is the rate of drug poisoning deaths per 100,000 population. We had 404 drug poisoning deaths between those years. And to contrast it with what Wisconsin as a state overall um, drug mortality rate was, that was 11. So if you're not familiar with your own county snapshot, um, you can go to countyhealthrankings.org and select from the map. Uh, look up your county and then look under additional measures for drug poisoning deaths. So many communities um, really need some assistance with following a process to improve health and this is our take action cycle. This is sort of the how within county health rankings and roadmaps. Um, so the process is laid out pretty um, clearly and not unlike many other community health improvement processes, communities gather information, they identify priorities to focus on what's important, and then select strategies that are effective and evidence-informed, put those into action, and then evaluate. Um, you'll see that communicate and work together sit outside the cycle because working together and communicating with stakeholders is really essential throughout all of those steps in the cycle. But at the heart, we know, is people working together because we know that complex issues and like childhood obesity and poor high school graduation rates, solving those issues really requires the wisdom and resources of everyone in the community. So there are many um, tools and guidance to help communities move along this cycle, and um, we'll be sharing some links that are relevant throughout today's webinar. So how do you even start the process of choosing effective policies and programs. We're all very busy people and it doesn't make a lot of sense to reinvent wheels or waste time implementing strategies that aren't impactful. Um, the What Works for Health database provides communities with information to help select and implement evidence-informed policies and programs and systems level changes that will improve the variety of factors we know and affect health. Um, our strategies are rated based on their evidence of effectiveness, and we have six ratings that range from evidence of ineffectiveness to scientifically supported. Um, from our 
what works for health page, you can click on any focus area. So for example, the topic for today's webinar, we could click on alcohol and drug use, and you would discover that there are 36 policies and programs filtered by alcohol and drug use. And one of the strategies you'll find here is naloxone access expansion. And in just a moment, we're going to hear from Corey and Robert about their experiences um, working on a national level and then locally with naloxone access expansion. Um, before we get to Corey and Robert, we just want to take a moment to introduce the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize. This prize honors and elevates U.S. communities that are really making great strides in their journey toward better health. Um, on this slide here, you'll see the six criteria that are core to the Culture of Health Prize. And the prize really recognizes and celebrates communities that have placed a priority on health and are creating powerful partnerships and deep commitments to make change. Um, change that enables all of us in our diverse society to lead healthier lives now and for generations to come. Um, this prize is awarded annually by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Communities that are awarded the prize work across lots of different health factors. Um, they define health broadly and they're focused strategically on policy systems and environmental change. And really, they're looking out for all, including the most vulnerable in the community. These communities often are working collaboratively with partners across a variety of sectors, and they use resources wisely and creatively um, to help measure and share success widely. So Mary's chatting out a link to our um, most recent Culture of Health Prize winners, and you can learn more um, at rwjf.org backslash prize. So, now we have the great pleasure to hear from our guests, Corey Davis and Robert Childs. Um, just, I'm going to do a brief introduction and then we really want to hear more from Corey and Robert about their experience with naloxone access expansion. So Corey is a staff attorney with the National Health Law Program uh, and Deputy Director at the Network for Public Health Law. Prior to joining um, the National Health Law Program, Corey served as an employment rights attorney at Equality Advocates in Pennsylvania, where he represented lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals before administrative commissions and in state and federal courts. And then Robert Childs is the executive director for the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition based in Wilmington. He's been the coalition's executive director since 2009 and oversees the agency's operations and innovation. And he's going to give us a great uh, local perspective about this particular strategy. If you're interested in learning more about them and, your, and their work, Mary's chatting out um, Corey and Robert's bios so you can um, learn a little bit more from them there. Um, so welcome. Uh, Corey and Robert, thank you so much for being here. And um, we're going to start with Corey, just to really help um, help us by defining the issue of opioid overdoses and and helping us to frame the scope of the problem. So um, can you kind of help set the stage for us a little bit on this specific topic, Corey? Sure, sure. You know, I, I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone on this webinar that um, the country is currently experiencing an epidemic of, of overdose deaths, <clears throat> and those overdose deaths are overwhelmingly driven by opioids. Up until a few years ago, we would have said that the, the epidemic is being driven by prescription opioids, and to some extent that's still true, but over the past few years we've seen just an explosion in uh, heroin-related morbidity and mortality. Um, the heroin death rate is actually up 26% um, year over year, 2013 to 2014, and tripled um, from 2010 to 2014. So it's just, um, just an incredible and still growing problem. That's, that's a striking statistic, Corey, and I know a lot of communities are really struggling with ways to, um, to address this, and I'm wondering if you can help us just even understand what exactly is naloxone as um, a specific strategy? 
Sure. Well, again, you know, most folks on the webinar will probably have some uh, knowledge of naloxone, so I won't get into it too deeply, but essentially naloxone is a medication. It's a um, prescription medication that was first approved by the FDA back in 1971, so it is, uh, it's a generic medication, although there are some um, proprietary formulations that have recently come on the market. And it reverses opioid overdose. It's a pure opioid antagonist, which means that it does nothing other than reverse opioid overdose. And it does that by essentially binding to the receptors in your brain that the opioids were occupying and knocking them out. So it actually physically removes the opioids from the brain, reversing uh, the overdose and bringing the person back to the state they were in beforehand. Um, it is a prescription medication, but it's not a controlled substance. Um, it's not controlled by the federal government or by any state. Um, it has no abuse potential. Like I said, it does absolutely nothing except um, you know, occupy and block that opioid receptor. If you administer naloxone to someone who has no opioids on their, in their system, it will have no clinical effect on them. Uh, it has a very good risk profile. What I mean by that is that um, it's like any medication. Um, it has the possibility of having side effects. The big one with naloxone is what we call precipitated withdrawal. And, you know, there's really a question about whether that should be called a side effect because that is actually the intended, um, the in, you know, the intended outcome. You want to take a person who's in overdose and bring them out of overdose. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on the individual, uh, that can cause a person to be agitated um, and angry. But, uh, you know, that's, that's much better than them being uh, not breathing in an overdose state. Um, and it's very stable medication. That's really referring to its, um, its storage properties. Uh, it should be kept in generally at room temperature and away from sunlight. Uh, but there has been some research done looking at what happens when the medication um, is kept out longer than its use by date or is cycled through, um, through temperature extremes. And they find that it's a, it's a very stable medication. Thanks so much, Corey. Um, since you really have this broader national perspective, why is naloxone access an important strategy? And what are some of the legal and, and policy issues associated? Sure. Well, like we said, you know, we have this epidemic of opioid overdose in the United States. And a lot of, you know, clearly and with good reason, a lot of the focus is on mortality, that is we're losing a lot of people, losing a lot of lives to opioid overdose. But I think we also need to remember that there are plenty of people who have an overdose um, that they come out of, but um, they may have morbidity related to that. Because remember, opioid overdose is really just another way of saying opioid-induced respiratory depression or respiratory arrest. Uh, which is a really bad state for someone to be in, even if it doesn't end up um, killing them. So we'll get to that in a little more detail later on. Um, as you said, opioid overdose death is largely preventable. Now, there are many, many um, things that we can do to try to prevent uh, addiction and dependence and so on in the first place. Uh, but even at the point where someone is overdosing, that overdose death is not an inevitability. It can be prevented with the administration of naloxone. Now, unfortunately, you know, traditionally, there are a number of laws and regulations that act as a barrier to naloxone access. Um, all of them were created for other reasons. You know, nobody tried to put up barriers to make it more difficult to access naloxone. These are just rules that are uh, rules of general application. For example, it's a prescription medication, so in general, um, you know, you need to see someone who is authorized to prescribe medications to get it. Um, and that's, you know, that has the side effect of keeping a lot of people who could be able to use naloxone from accessing it. Um, but because we have these laws that, 
you know, we're not designed to make it harder to get naloxone. What we see is that um, they can be modified relatively easily, uh, relatively quickly, to instead of acting as a barrier to naloxone, can really facilitate people's access uh, to naloxone to make it more likely that it's on scene when and where um, it's needed to reverse an overdose. Thanks, Corey. And I think Robert's going to talk about some of those um, ways that he was able to navigate kind of some challenges to make naloxone access um, much easier uh, for folks in, in North Carolina. I'm wondering if you can tell us what some of, of the barriers that you've heard of um, as you have worked with different communities across the country. What are some of the barriers that, that you've heard or learned about? Sure. Is this a new slide? Yep. I just changed it for you. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, the new slide hasn't actually come up for me, but um, I will still kind of talk through them. Um, you know, like you said, there are um, there all generally have to do with the fact that in general, um, for a prescription uh, for a prescription medication to be valid you need to have uh, the traditional doctor-patient relationship. That means that, um, or a prescriber-patient relationship, because there are medical professionals other than physicians who are authorized to issue prescriptions. Um, but traditionally, the provider and the patient you know, need to have that interaction where the provider examines the patient, diagnoses the patient and then prescribes the medication that is uh, indicated to treat that patient's condition. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good general rule. The problem is um, that, you know, like I said, it acts as a barrier to access. Mm -hmm. There are not that many prescribers around as anyone who's tried to, you know, get a just an appointment with their doctor or other provider for a physical or some other sort of non-emergency um, appointment. Um, they can be very expensive, particularly for people who are uninsured or underinsured. Um, there are lots of people for whom going to the doctor is not just a five or ten dollar uh, copay. And of course, many people who are at highest risk of overdose are not connected to the healthcare system. Now, there are lots of people who are overdosing, both fatally and not, who are um, who have, you know, I'm making air quotes, legitimate um, opioid prescriptions, and sort of are connected to the to the healthcare system. But there are lots and lots of people um, who for reasons of cost or for reasons of stigma um, or you know for for a million different reasons uh, are just not going to pick up the phone and call their provider and make an appointment or walk into a pharmacy so those are kinds of um, problems um, with you know accessing the lock zone on that end on the other end we um, have the problem you know whereby you know, drug misuse um, and um, drug abuse have been criminalized in lots of different ways in the United States. So people who are using drugs in a way that makes it more likely um, that they're going to overdose are oftentimes, you know, using illegal drugs or using their legal drugs other than prescribed. Mm -hmm. And they know that um, that can get them in trouble, um, including, you know, arrest, conviction, and incarceration. So we find that people at the scene of an overdose are often afraid to call 911, so they will either not call at all, or they'll try all kinds of sort of folk remedies first, um, and then when nothing else works, they, they'll pick up the phone and call 911, and unfortunately, um, by that time, it's, it's sometimes too late. Um, and the final bullet here, um, first responders don't always have naloxone. There's been a lot of uh, movement on this just in the past you know, year or two, but um, we did a survey just about two years ago and found that um, 
in a large number of states, even EMTs weren't authorized to carry naloxone. And at that time, there were no law enforcement officers carrying naloxone. And this is where that morbidity um, you know, discussion is important. Um, it's Opioid-induced respiratory depression um, is um, a problem whose effects are cumulative. Right, so if you have someone who is um, whose brain is not getting the oxygen that it needs um, for three minutes, as opposed to you know ten minutes, which might be the difference between you know one emergency responder and another emergency responder, or between the layperson on the scene and the emergency responder coming, it may not be the difference between life and death, although sometimes it will be. Um, but it's going to be the difference between, um, you know, no permanent impairments or some permanent impairments. So yeah. that's, um, I think it's a really important point that I don't see emphasized enough. That the time to emergency response with naloxone administration is extremely important. Such an important point, Corey. I appreciate you bringing that up. And um, also recognizing that there's some... Um, changes that we're seeing across the country that um, you know maybe will help advance um, this work of looking for um, harm reduction strategies to save lives. Can you tell us some changes that you're seeing that are really critical to moving forward? Sure, sure. Um, you know, so I think that there are some big picture um, changes that are on this slide and then some more specific uh, naloxone related changes. So, you know, I think that it has, you know, we have seen, I say over the past decade, but certainly over the past five or six years, really sort of a, a, a changing uh, in the way that at least some government officials really view and, and talk about the problems of, of drug abuse and addiction. Um, much more of a shift towards viewing and discussing them as, you know, primarily public health issues as opposed to primarily criminal justice issues. Now, of course, there's a long way to go there, but you're certainly seeing that, seeing a shift there. Um, and I say, you know, I, I think that this is, um, you see this with the change at the stage towards, um, you know, more common sense approaches to marijuana. Um, we see it in rollback of some of these more draconian sort of three-strike sentencing laws, um, the crack and cocaine disparity, and in a bunch of the changes um, that we're going to talk about with relation to naloxone access specifically. Right. Right. So t tell us a little bit about what you, you what you know um, about how states are responding. And I know you've done some work um, collecting data around the country and, and how states are responding. And we've got some really compelling um, graphics to show. But um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening across the country on a state level? Sure, sure, sure. So there are um, you know quite a number of initiatives in most states. Um, sort of have taken a multi-pronged approach where they have implemented, um, you know, a number of these initiatives at the same time. And, you know, the goal of all of these is to make sure or at least increase the probability that naloxone is going to be um, where it's needed, when it's needed. Um, so I've, I've put some of the big ones here. So the first one is permitting prescription to third parties. And what that means is allowing the prescriber to prescribe naloxone for use on someone other than the patient that they're, that's in front of them, right? So um, this permits, for example, um, you know, a mother to go to her um, primary care um, professional, you know, and, and, and say something like, you know, my, um, my son's been, been having a problem with drugs and he's actually in rehab, he's coming home and I'm I've heard about this 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 Narcan thing. Um, can you give me a prescription for me to have um, if something should happen to him? So I would be prepared. Um, under those traditional medical practice laws, um, the provider really is not able to do that because that prescription would be for use on someone that the provider hasn't personally examined. But um, if you permit prescription to third parties, 
then they can do that. The third party there, of course, would, would be the Sun. So a number of states have made that change. Um, the second one is permitting prescription dispensing by standing or protocol order. And this is just another variation on, on that theme, um, whereby the state, typically the state um, legislature will change the law to say that the someone who's otherwise authorized to prescribe naloxone, so your doctors and physician assistants, nurse practitioners, whatever um, whatever professionals are already authorized by state law, can issue a prescription um, that's not for a particular patient, but is valid for anyone who meets the criteria specified in the order. You know, so it could say. Um, a doctor could write a prescription that says, um, you know, go ahead and dispense naloxone to anyone who is at risk of overdose or is a friend or family member who is in contact with someone at risk of overdose. So it's, um, it still requires a, a prescription, but it's really broadening that circle of people who can get naloxone under that prescription. Again, this is all, you know, designed to get rid of that barrier whereby it's oftentimes hard to get the person who's at risk and the medical provider in the same room at the same time. Um, bullet three uh, hey, provides Corey, civil... This is Stephanie. Um, I am so sorry to interrupt you, but I'm wondering if there are differences between states around this prescription um, to third parties. Is that something that is really variable state to state as are a lot of what you're describing or are there some common threads? Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how, whether you're sort of talking about this as a global, all states have this or is this really specific to specific states? Yeah, well, so um, I, um, maybe you can send out the, the link. I mean, I have a, a table where I kind of go through um, which states have implemented each of these initiatives. Um, so there's definitely variation between the states as to which states um, have changed the law to permit all of these different things. There is some variation between the states as to um, you know the the particulars of of each of those, um, not so much variation on the third party um, prescription one. Most states are pretty broad on that, where it's essentially anyone. Um, there are um, some differences on the the standing order, whereby most well the majority of states. Um, only permit that standing order to authorize people who are already authorized to dispense naloxone to dispense it, so pharmacists in general. Um, but there are about a dozen states that permit that, um, that prescriber to write a standing order to permit other um, groups or people to dispense naloxone. So for example, um, you know, drug treatment centers or jails or harm reduction organizations like Roberts um, who are not, you know, are not generally permitted to give out prescription medications, um, but the law has been changed to say that they can, um, they can dispense those medications um, if they're um, if they're permitted to do so by whoever signed the standing order. Great, so yes, thank there you. are there are variations um, both in which states have done what and uh, <laughs> and what yeah. they're permitted to do. Yeah, um, I just kind of advanced a few slides to show some graphics and um, some data on um, where, um, you know, there's been a response for providing Good Samaritan laws and naloxone access, and um, so I, I was so sorry to interrupt you. Was there anything more that you would want to reflect on for that um, kind of state response? I'm going to go back to that PowerPoint slide. Um, before we move on to hear kind of from a from a local community um, from Robert in, in North Carolina. Yeah, I mean the only other thing I would want to hit on here is the Good Samaritan laws, and sure. um, the important thing to know here is that um, these are different from the civil Good Samaritan laws that every state has. These are criminal Good Samaritan laws, and they are specific to the overdose context. And these are intended to address that problem whereby 
you know, you've got someone who's overdosing, you've got someone else at the scene of the overdose, because most people don't actually overdose alone. There's usually someone else there. Um, to encourage them to, to pick up the phone and call 911. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of variations among the states as to what those laws do. But in general, they provide protection from, you know, relatively minor drug crimes to say, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to throw you in jail for having drugs um, because we want you to do the right thing. We want to nudge you into um, into saving a life, and we think that, you know, as a society, saving someone's life is more important than than locking someone up on a on a minor drug crime. Yeah, thank you so much. There, um, it looks like one of our. Um, Attendee says that Utah does now have a good Samaritan law, so it looks like maybe things are, are you know, moving moving along and um, keeping up with the with the changing data. Um, the the changes are happening fast, so that's a good that's a good thing. Um, anything more you wanted to say, um, Corey, about just this growth that we've seen, kind of how this change is happening quite rapidly, I think is um, illustrated in this slide, that there's been uh, a real uptick in Good Samaritan laws and naloxone access. No, I mean, I think that uh, just, you know, say these laws have been, um, you know, adopted in big states, small states, rural states, urban states, red states, blue states. Um, the epidemic really, um, you know, doesn't follow state boundaries, and states have overwhelmingly kind of done the, um, you know, tried to address that by passing these laws. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what I would like to do is, is really um, kind of transition from this national kind of state overview response to um, turning over to our second guest, Robert Childs, to, to hear about the great work that he's been doing with um, the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition and really dig into um, kind of some local examples and local work. I know a lot of folks on our webinar are, are really interested in kind of how to implement this at the local level. So um, Robert, welcome and I wonder if you could start off by helping us understand what is harm reduction? If you could kind of give us a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what harm reduction means. Absolutely, and harm reduction is a way of preventing disease and promoting health that meets people where they are at rather than making judgments about where they should be in terms of their personal health and lifestyle. So accepting that not everyone is ready or able to stop risky or illegal behavior, harm reduction really focuses on promoting scientifically proven ways of mitigating health risks associated with drug use and other high-risk behavior. So you can think about condom distribution, access to sterile syringes, medications for opioid dependence such as methadone or buprenorphine, and overdose prevention. But I think the one that really unifies us in getting people to understand what harm reduction is, is think about like driving a car. Like driving a car is the most hazardous thing for your health, or not, you know, overdose is going to overtake that soon, but it is historically one of the most, one of the things that's going to get you. And so none of us, knowing that we could potentially die at any point in a car, are abstinent from them, especially in the South and especially in rural areas. So we take a harm reduction approach to it, which means we're trying to decrease the health risks associated with driving a car. So abstinence would be super. However, you know, most of us, are, especially in the public health community, may decide to get a Volvo. They're very safe, great cars. We may also decide to get airbags in our car, seat belts, right? We may get, you know, uh, anti-lock brakes put on or similar measures. Those are all harm reduction. So we're taking a dangerous behavior and just try and make it as safe as possible. And especially with people who use drugs, you know, sometimes they may not have access to drug treatment. They may not have access to um, medications for opioid dependence. They may not have access to detox or harm reduction information. So we want to keep people as safe as possible while they're in the boogie um, until they're ready for that next step, if they ever get to that next step. And that's kind of the concept of harm reduction. 
Right. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's a good framing. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, rural and urban communities, and and there we have a diverse audience of folks who've come from rural and urban communities, and I'm just wondering. Um, if you can sort of tell us about your local example and about the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Tell us a little bit about your work there in North Carolina. Sure, so North Carolina Harm Reduction is North Carolina's only comprehensive harm reduction program. And our program actually overflows into our other surrounding southern states. And what we do is engage in grassroots advocacy, resource development, coalition building, and direct services for law enforcement and those made vulnerable by drug use, sex work, overdose, immigration status, gender, sexually transmitted infections, HIV, and Hep C. And one of the key words which I highlighted in uh, when I was talking about what we directly do is our work with law enforcement, which has positioned us uniquely to move our work forward. But stepping back a little bit, because I'm going to go back to that point. You know, we've been around. We were founded in 2004, incorporated in 06. And initially, we were mostly like a syringe exchange advocacy group. And I came to the agency in 2009. What we really you know, tried to do from that point forward was have a comprehensive approach to harm reduction, what we were pushing, and also incorporating people who were traditionally critical of harm reduction and getting them to buy into what we're doing in order to engage them and get them to be part of the solution to solving harm reduction issues that were happening in North Carolina. So we, as the data in the, you know, in the following slides will show, we have an increase in overdose deaths, increase in HIV, increase in viral hepatitis, increase in needle sticks to law enforcement. There was all these issues, and so we try to unify, get everybody on the same page so we could then work on joint solutions. And so together, law enforcement, faith community, veterans, active drug users, active sex workers, retired drug users, retired sex workers, people in and out of retirement. We all gathered, um, and we also had the help of an amazing lawyer. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. His name's Corey Davis. And what we did was, you know, we came together to, like, what are some of the things we can do to change what's happening in red North Carolina to improve the situation? And we were able, through that partnership, to pass five really awesome harm reduction bills in red state North Carolina, we passed the first uh, naloxone good SAM bill in a red state in the country. Um, you know, we were able to pass the first Republican-based syringe decriminalization laws through having getting everybody on the same page and moving forward. And we have membership that's everything from liberals to conservatives to law enforcement to drug users. We have very good dance parties, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we have found a way to unify everybody to focus on, you know, one of our big public health issues and public safety issues to move us forward in order to, you know, have success. And, you know, we have developed the South's largest naloxone distribution network, and we've also gone law enforcement to engage, help us out with messaging uh, about the work to legislators, as well as getting to look different. Uh, look differently at what's going on in their home communities and look at different solutions. So a bit of like extra how we're different is like we incorporate drug user and law enforcement feedback in everything we do and we actively train and organize not only public health people, nerdy folks who are engaged in this issue, but also law enforcement and active drug users in order to get us all to work on a joint plan. And that joint plan led in 2013 to one of our signature pieces of legislation, which was called Senate Bill 20, the Good Samaritan Naloxone Law. Um, and it was the first, again, Republican one in the country. And what we were really doing was engaging you know, legislators and lobbyists and trying to get them to understand you know, why this was an important law. We also got a powerful backing from the Child Fatality Task Force, which works on child death prevention, uh, which helped us secure several very powerful Republican uh, primaries in order to sponsor the bill. We also had extremely powerful storytellers like moms who have lost their kids, veterans, faith leaders, and law enforcement, and we were able to unify conservatives and liberals um, by using nonpartisan language. And that was very key that we used language and also used messengers who could convey that language to illustrate that this is a nonpartisan issue that we need to move forward on.
Well, clearly, Robert, I mean, you have had tremendous success. And as the slide on the, on the screen shows, um, the number of overdose reversals that have been reported to your coalition through the use of naloxone has, um, has gone up. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about some of the components or, um, you know, what were, you named several approaches and strategies. What do you think was the, was the real, maybe, kind of key strategy that helped make this successful in North Carolina? So, the, one of the key things that we have that allows us to be successful is a standing order to distribute naloxone through staff, our consultants, and our key volunteers. So again, a standing order is a special prescription written by a medical provider that can be written for a group of people who meet certain ca characteristics, such as people at risk of opioid overdose or their loved ones, rather than the named individual. And so what that special order is, and so folks know, we had to talk to over 200 doctors in order to find the first doctor in the South to write a standing order. So if you come across a couple of doctors who are like, eh, I don't want to do that, you know, don't let that beat you down. Really, you've got to talk to a lot of them. Where when we helped pass a bill in Georgia, uh, we talked to one doctor and they said yes. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, um, you got to, you know, hammer in. If you find the right person, you know, they'll do it and they love it and it's awesome. And so, you know, what would, how we've had success is we distribute naloxone in several places, but the most important place to find out where to distribute naloxone is to ask active drug users. If you ask active drug users, they'll tell you where to go. And so in the South, for example, we don't have legalized syringe exchange where most of the naloxone programs are based, you know, in the blue states. So we actually have 10 underground syringe exchanges in North Carolina, so we do distribute there. We also have drug user unions where we distribute through. We also have, uh, we also distribute in rural and urban drug courts. So we go to the drug court and the judge is actually mandated that everybody get naloxone. It's awesome. And then we have lots of people there who've used it. Uh, one of the other unique places that we distribute, which has led to the rise of our overdose reversals that you saw in the previous slide, is we distribute at 90% of the methadone and buprenorphine clinics in North Carolina. And so if you look at our original overdose reversals in 2013, which is that first little bit on the slide, we only had 35. We were mostly uh, going through one underground syringe exchange, um, and we were really like getting out the word about it, but you know, still we're having only so much success. And then towards the end of 2014, we started getting in a lot of uh, methadone clinics. And then when we went back to the methadone clinics post-distribution, you see in early 2015 a giant rise in our overdose reversal numbers and also our ability to collect information because we kept going back to the site of distribution every one to three months depending on the clinic, finding out about more and more rescues and then people, you know, were telling us more and more about it. So that was really excellent. Yeah. The other place that we distribute that's kind of key is finding pharmacies that actively sell syringes, and this is really important in red states, and giving them the Loxone kits through a standing order to pass them out there. It's not as mm. effective as methadone clinics, uh, drug courts, drug user groups, or syringe exchanges, but it's another place you can go to distribute. Mm -hmm. Tell us about um, sort of the impact that you've seen working with law enforcement. I mean, I have a slide yeah. here that looks at the number of reversals reported to your coalition that were provided by law enforcement, um, and I just find it really compelling to think about the impact um, through law enforcement and the impact through community level distribution. Yeah, so we've worked with about 45 departments that are now up and running uh, that do law enforcement naloxone programs. And it's awesome that they want to do it. It's great they want to be part of the solution. However, they will never be as effective as drug user based naloxone programs because drug users are oftentimes afraid to call EMS, afraid to call law enforcement to respond to their drug overdoses, or when they do, the person's blue and the person, uh, EMS and law enforcement, may be five to 30 minutes before they can arrive on scene, and the person may have unfortunately passed away at that point. And so it's really important to get naloxone to the site of the drug overdose, which is where drug users and their loved ones are congregating. So as you can see, over the last year, you know, we've had 1,780 rescues just over the last year out of our 2,100 total as of this morning. 
And as you can tell, that only 33 of the reversals were from law enforcement. The whole rest of it were from a tiny nonprofit, you know, which up until recently only had two employees, where we were able to get naloxone out throughout the entire state and have way more impact over these departments with way larger budgets. I'm not saying for them not to do it. There's a great department up in Quincy, Massachusetts, for example, led by the amazing Pat Glenn, which has had over 400 rescues. They're doing a phenomenal job. Um, but what we know in North Carolina and what we also know from the Georgia data is that the community-based organizations are rocking it because they are equipping individuals with naloxone at the site of the drug overdose so people can immediately administer it and mm. save a life. And the one thing we're all about in doing is enabling life. Yeah, yeah. We have a question from one of our um, attendees who's wondering about whether um, you've had any success, or maybe Corey, you could speak to this as well, any success in getting naloxone into schools. Um, not sure what the you know incidence rate is, but any experience with that? Either Corey or Robert. So we haven't done that yet. I believe there is a small, there's a potential program up in Cherokee County, North Carolina, um, okay. but we have not done that um, because we focus primarily on active injection drug user networks. Okay. Um, but you know, it, it gets a little tricky with the, when people are under 18. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, Corey may be able to talk about that more, but like, we know like Adapt Pharma just did a partnership with Clinton Foundation to try and expand you know, school-based uh, naloxone access. Um, but you know, I, haven't, I haven't seen much data on how effective that is. OK. Corey, do you have any um, experience with that? No, I mean, it, Rob's right. It can get a little um, complicated legally. Um, as far as administering naloxone by school nurses. I mean, I would also say it's a very low yield environment. I mean, we, you know, we know of about 28,000 opioid related overdoses last year. And as far as I know, zero of them were in schools. So okay. um, it's okay. not the first place I would be looking. Yeah. Well, let's. Um, we've got about um, eight minutes left to the top of the hour, and and um, I know there are some important lessons learned that we wanted to make sure our um, audience hears. And I should also just let those on the call know that we're going to hold a 15-minute um, sort of after-class discussion to continue the Q&A with Corey and Robert. So if you're able to stay with us, um, we'll continue the webinar for another 15 minutes for those of you who may have some additional questions. But um, for those who may need to jump off the webinar, let's um, kind of start thinking about some lessons learned or some um, some takeaways that would be helpful um, for you guys to leave us with. So I will turn it to um, maybe Robert first, and then if Corey, there are any other comments that you'd like to share, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. So I would say like some of the really important lessons is if you do not ask drug users where to distribute naloxone, you're missing one of the major pieces of distribution and figuring out what your community needs. So if you are looking to distribute naloxone, really you need to make sure to ask active drug users what do they need and where should you be distributing. And maybe the person distributing should be the active drug users. So we have over 160 distributors under North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. So you really don't have to go over 45 minutes in our state to get naloxone. A lot of them are people who've lost loved ones. A lot of them are active drug users, and some are retired drug users. And you know, those are the folks who know where to go and have the social networks that they can access in order to get naloxone out to their friends and loved ones who will never talk to a public health person. Right, so it's really important to remember that. And if you don't have legalized syringe exchange in your state and you're afraid or hesitant to work with the underground exchanges, which are almost in every state at this point, 
you know, methadone and buprenorphine clinics are excellent distribution sites, especially to access rural populations. And so we've been able to have a lot of success in rural environments because we have accessed methadone and buprenorphine clinics in such sites, which have allowed us to have greater reach. And when we go back to those sites, we're able to learn a lot about the rescues that have occurred, which is fantastic. And the other thing, you know, we didn't get to highlight as much is we have over 300 media articles we've been putting out a year on overdose prevention, harm reduction, syringe access, you know, and a variety of issues that relate to our work. And that has been very important to getting out the word on the importance of this. And so, you know, if you don't engage the media, people don't know about it, and, not, and then they won't know to even holler at you. So it's really important to do that. And I also want to say, We've probably distributed five naloxone kits out of our 22,000 at our office. The reason we've had success is we don't stay at our office, we go to the people. And so I would say, you know, it's great to have these fixed site distributions, but unless you go out, you know, you're not going to get uh, community buy-in and you're also going to have, you know, some difficulty with getting the numbers up. And so I really encourage people to leave their office and go to where the folks who use drugs are congregating and their loved ones in order to distribute. And also know that there is some donation programs for naloxone, so if you're like wondering how to fund it, you know, feel free to contact us at uh, North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition or go to naloxoneinfo.org. Uh, like they're both really, you know, we're happy to help share anything we've done with anyone in order to help you get your program up and running. I appreciate that, Robert. Thank you so much. Um, Corey, just maybe some quick parting thoughts, and then I know there are, are a couple questions um, before the top of the hour. So um, any other parting thoughts that you'd like to share? And um, <clears throat> I won't read this slide. I will let people, um, I'll let people read it for themselves so we can uh, answer a couple questions. Okay, all right. Um, so just want to take a moment to um, stop on these reflection questions that we started with the at the beginning of the webinar and to let folks know that we have community coaches through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, support um, to fund our community coaches. Our assistance is available at no cost and we provide community leaders with direct support to strengthen their capacity to advance health improvement efforts um, in communities. And um, we want to take a moment for a few questions that have come in from our webinar attendees. Um, one is the, I know that you, you mentioned something, Robert, a bit ago about funding the purchase of naloxone mm -hmm. kits. Um, what's the best strategy for, you know, accessing um, naloxone kits for a community that's looking at a, at, um, a distribution program? Sure. So um, first you have to decide what technology you want to use. So like intermuscular naloxone tends to be the cheapest at cost. They come with 3cc the syringes. They look like horse needles basically. Um, and when you use those, those aren't the ones that are typically used to inject heroin. It's extremely rare. Um, and so, you know, they're it's super easy to use, very little trainings required, and they are excellent in like 95% of our overdose reversals are that kind. Then there's the new Adapt Farm, uh, Adapt Narcan product, which is a kind of like a nasal auto injector. It runs 37.50 for public interest price. And then there is uh, the old school nasal um, by that Amplistar is selling, and that can run for a two dose kit, which you need two doses, is 90 to 140 ish, depending on your your negotiation power. Um, and where you are in the country, and then there's Abzios, which are a couple hundred bucks. But if you are starting up a program, you're just starting up, you aren't expecting to give out a couple hundred, Abzio does have a donation program you can uh, apply to, and Abzio's parent company is called Kaleo, and if you go to Kaleo Cares, um, there's information about applying for Great. some free kits. Great, thank you. Um, another guest um, wanted to know more about where where would they be able to find state specific data, and um, I'm wondering if that state specific data related to um, did they say Mary specific to what they were looking for? 
yes, there are several questions related to this. Some it was related to if people had Good Samaritan laws, and we did send out a link about that. But just is there one source for state-specific data, or is it really kind of within these various uh, topic areas related, whether it's Good Samaritan laws, what's the status of the laws in their state? Is there one source we can uh, refer people to? Yeah, well, as far as the laws, um, I have a document at the Network for Public Health Law website, and I, I think it's one of the ones that you, you sent out that has um, <clears throat> both um, which states have passed the laws and has the characteristics of the laws that were passed broken down. So that's a good that's a good source, and I'm always happy to um, to answer individual questions as well. If folks just want to email me. Great, and we did send out your bio um, with the um, contact information, and we are at the top of the hour. I'm just going to quickly wrap up um, with these final slides, and then, like I said earlier, for those of you who would like to stay on, we'll continue for another 15 minutes with um, Corey and Robert. Um, but thank you so much for the time that you've shared with us today, and we encourage um, those of you on the webinar to stay connected with us um, through Twitter and Facebook and to sign up for our e-newsletter. Um, we also want to acknowledge the many, many um, contributions of our partners who make this work possible, including these folks listed here. And at the beginning of the webinar, we introduced this guiding question, and we hope that this has generated some new ideas and thoughts about addressing opioid overdoses in your community. So. Um, this is our um, countyhealthrankings.org website. To um, learn more, we will be archiving this webinar, so in the next couple of days, you can check back um, if you'd like to send that link on to others um, that you may be working with and collaborating with. Um, we always love to see that um, partnership develop as a result of our, of our work. And um, so, We'll spend the next 15 minutes um, looking at or um, addressing additional questions that have come through. Um, I am going to um, turn it over to Mary, and she's um, been looking at some of the questions that have come through to um, continue the conversation. So go ahead, Mary. Oh, Mary and I need to switch headsets for just a moment. One moment. Thank you. Yes, there's been a tremendous response by many of you. And so here's a few of the questions, uh, Rob and Corey. One, are, are firefighters as first responders trained in Loloxone administration? That just depends on... Um, it depends entirely on the, the state and the locality. Um, firefighters are increasingly uh, cross-trained as either EMTs or paramedics, um, but a number of states are permitting firefighters who don't have other medical certifications um, and authorizing them to become trained in and to administer um, naloxone, so that really just depends on where you are. All right, thank you. And there have been a lot of questions, too, uh, related to um, when an overdose occurs and someone is at an ER. Are healthcare professionals referring people to recovery programs? Just the whole link between the, the incredible importance of naloxone saving lives, but a lot of questions about then, you know, how do you get people into treatment so that they, they get help? Do you have advice on that? So I would say, like, the important thing is, like, in, I can say for the North Carolina and the Georgia overdose prevention kits, there's information on drug treatment and local resources uh, if somebody wants to engage in a recovery service at that point. Um, the 
but like a lot of folks may have difficulty accessing drug treatment if they have a record, if they are mentally ill, if they don't have 30 days that they haven't used, or if they've used, uh, haven't used recently, they may not take them. So there's a lot of complications with the treatment system. And what we're seeing in a lot of red states is there are being cuts to treatment, so there's less and less treatment options. And so it's a bit more complicated than like just making a referral even though we're all pushing for drug treatment um, and for people to have access to detox, methadone, buprenorphine. However, the criminalization of overdose has complicated this severely, as well as the decrease of access to drug treatment. And so that's what makes harm reduction more important than ever, because we need to keep these folks alive till the state, until the private sector steps up to the epidemic. Um, in order to really address what's going on. Um, and so I say it's extremely important that people have access to the detox and to the drug treatment information, but we know the system as it is right now isn't adequate for the need of the people that we are working with. Thank you. That's such an important po point in terms of all the barriers that people experience. But do you have advice in terms of families or friends, you know, that are healthcare organizations that are working with addicted persons on a day-to-day -day basis, and 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 how can they help, you know, considering that there are these barriers? Do you have yeah, I think a lot advice? of it is based off motivational interviewing, so you should really be working off what the patient says is actually achievable. So, you know, if they're, you know, you really want to work with the patient to identify what is an achievable goal and work with them on that. And initially, you know, and it's also important not to be forcing things on people if they don't want it or it's not realistic or it's not affordable or they don't have health insurance. Um, you know, we have to take all these things into key, and especially in the South and in the red states, we are seeing that there aren't enough resources available. Uh, we work with a local pastor in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and that for like half a million people, I think there's like 17 treatment beds or something ridiculously small for the need of that zone. And so, you know, we're having to drive people all over the state to get them into treatment, and we there isn't enough in a lot of the small local and rural communities for the need, which is very problematic. But we say, um, you know, it's really important to do motivational interviewing in order to figure out what the patient wants versus what we want. Because again, if it's what we want, it may not be a successful referral. And the other thing is it's really important to get people access to methadone and buprenorphine. These are evidence-based interventions to decrease the negative effects um, of opioid dependency and opioid dependency. So like it really helps stabilize people if we can get them on these life-saving medications and will also decrease the negative impacts of the overdose epidemic if we expand access. And there's a lot of really great resources on it, but with the cap on the amount of people can serve with buprenorphine, it's really limiting our treatment options to get people stable. And that's extremely concerning in the United States right now. Thank you. That's really helpful, and I think it addressed several questions that people have. And can you also talk about, and maybe you touched on this, but are you finding that there's a need for different types of programs and strategies and policies in rural areas versus urban areas? Yeah, I think like... Um, with us, like we've really um, been dependent on individual social networks in order to find like people that need of, um, services in rural environments. And so the way we've taken advantage of that is to going to places where rural people congregate. Um, and so that may be a barbecue, or maybe, which is my favorite event, um, or it could be going to drug court, or it could be, you know, working at a rural methadone clinic where a lot of the opiate-dependent folks who are getting medication management are coming into a single site. You know, we hang out in the waiting room and we chat to them. We talk about risk reduction. We talk about extra recovery and treatment options. We talk about harm reduction. We talk about staying safe. We give them the naloxone then and there in the waiting room. Um, and then talks also to them, like, if you want an extra because you're worried about somebody, take it. Please take it. 
so we can take care of your mates. And then we start, you know, talking about all the other harm reduction platform and also get people involved with talking to their legislators so then we can have the legislators more knowledgeable about the issues on the ground. And so most of our legislation, interestingly, uh, for overdose has actually been from people representing more rural zones uh, because they get it, um, because it is such a big issue. But I would say for like the rural environments, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're initially trying to map where you need to go, you know, it may seem a bit overwhelming. But if you ask the people who use drugs and the people on methadone or buprenorphine, you can find out really fast where you're supposed to go. Um, and if you, especially if you have somebody who's from that community, they can normally connect you with the spots that you need to hit up. But I would say, like, the key places we found are the methadone clinics, the rural syringe exchanges, um, and also the drug courts. And we've also distributed at rural churches. So they may have a high amount of um, folks who were drug dependent at specific churches, and we have then distributed at those sites because people are, again, congregating, and you can get a lot of the word out. Uh, I do want to give props to Haywood County uh, Police Departments and Sheriffs in Western Carolina and Appalachia. Like They have an active engagement program in uh, churches, which is fantastic. And then in rural Brunswick County, uh, which is on the coast, which has one of the highest heroin death rates in North Carolina, they've actually started town halls where it's just talking about heroin and opioid and opiate related overdose and they're letting us distribute naloxone at those events as well and talking about harm reduction and keeping people alive. So, you know, there's some really good examples and I'm happy to chat to anybody one on one about like doing rural interventions and also naloxone info that already has some really good information. So um, if anybody has any further, you know, individual questions for their state, I'm happy to chat to them. That's wonderful, and I'll, this is Mary, I'll remind people that we did send out the bio and the link to both of these organizations so you can get contact information for both of our uh, exceptional guests. Um, I have one, another question here is, do you have suggestions on how to create a culture of change within law enforcement? agencies. You talked about that there are some stellar ones, but how, could you have tips for really how to help to increase the acceptance of naloxone administration by law enforcement? So I could give a North Carolina example. So in North Carolina, um, you know, we really push law enforcement naloxone. Um, and the way we did it is, you know, like uh, harm reduction people often like to hear from harm reduction, recovery people often like to hear from recovery people. We use law enforcement as messengers to talk to law enforcement about why they should be down with this. And so, you know, we once we had one department start, you know, they would talk to the next one, and then they would talk to their mate who runs the other department, and we found that to be the most successful thing possible. Because there's some law enforcement I've been talking to for five years, and they're like, nope. And then once one of uh, my law enforcement mates just calls them, they're like, absolutely. So, you know, it's really, you know, you want to definitely use law enforcement as messengers if you're trying to get them to carry naloxone. We have a arsenal of southern uh, law enforcement who would be happy to talk to your department because they love naloxone, think it's fantastic. And, you know, they really are happy to share about their successes. And we have everything with conservative law enforcement liberal law enforcement and some moderates if folks are into that who can talk to people um, about why it works for them and why it works for their department and why they think it's good for the community. Um, and some of them are doing it because of their belief that every human life is sacred and they should be doing it for every single human life. Uh, they have some that are doing it because, you know, it's a positive thing for the community. Uh, we have some that are doing it because the officers are getting PTSD from seeing so many deaths. Like, they're just like, the commanders and sheriffs and police chiefs are like, I have a bunch of officers with PTSD. I don't want to have to deal with that when they can do something about it. And that doing is carrying naloxone so they can reverse a drug overdose. So, you know, there are all a variety of different things. But if anybody's having trouble with their department, we do have uh, multiple law enforcement on our staff and consultants and some independent uh, sheriffs and police chiefs would be happy to talk about why it's most important. But using law enforcement as a messenger is the key item because oftentimes they 
um, they can't hear it as well from public healthy folks. Thank you so much. Just a richness of uh, advice and specific information and resources and the links that we chatted out um, uh, are will be a wealth of information for the audience. Uh, we're just about to close and I want to share that I don't know who it was but someone chatted out saying that they're glad to report that we just received 175 kits this week in our county and met with the chief of police yesterday and others and this is a great hope for many of our uh, addicts and abusers. So uh, I think you've given us, as I said, just amazing information. Just want to uh, thank our audience for joining us and thank our guests for their wealth of information and your generosity to uh, be willing to talk with people more, respond to emails if people have questions. And thank you and um, we look forward to seeing those of you in the audience on a future webinar.